Thank you uh, very much and welcome to uh, everybody. Uh, I will, I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, this, uh, this session. Um, I will, uh, we will have uh, several uh, speakers and I will introduce each uh, of the speakers very shortly. Uh, the first one will be uh, um, my uh, co-chair of the conference, uh, Sharon Lewin. Uh, Sharon, as you know, is uh, uh, director of the Infectious Disease Unit at uh, the uh, uh, Alfred Hospital, and she's professor of medicine also at the Monash University. I have the pleasure, indeed, to uh, co-chair not only uh, uh, the, the, the conference with uh, Sharon, but uh, we are also co-chairing a symposium on HIV cure together with uh, Steve Dix and Steve Dix and myself, uh, together with the help of Charon, are also now co-chairing the IAS towards an HIV cure initiative. Um, so the, the second speaker uh, after Sharon will be uh, Deborah Perso. Deborah Perso uh, is very much involved in the work on the so-called Mississippi baby, who is not a baby anymore, uh, by the way. And uh, Deborah will uh, tell us about the latest news regarding uh, the Mississippi baby. Uh, the uh, next uh, speaker will be Dan Barouche. Dan is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And uh, Dan is uh, working on uh, a new vaccine approach, in particular using uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And uh, uh, he will tell us about the last, latest data uh, regarding use of broadly neutralizing antibody in cure. Uh, the next uh, speaker with, will be Ole, Ole Sogard, uh, working at uh, uh, Harris uh, University uh, uh, in the Department of Infectious Disease of uh, the University. Ole will present uh, the latest data that they have uh, uh, using a drug, omedipsin, uh, a drug which is able to um, reactivate. Uh, the latently uh, in infected cells. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Nicolas, Nicolas Chaumont. Uh, Nicolas is uh, currently working at the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute in Florida. Um, and Nicolas is, will present uh, work uh, that has been uh, presented yesterday at the CURE Symposium regarding new assays uh, to uh, quantify and to measure uh, the reservoir. Uh, and Steve Dix at the end uh, will uh, tell us about his own vision of the future of cure. So please, Sharon, first. Thank you, Francoise. So um, I thought I'd, I'd set the scene of where um, cure research has come to, especially given what we've found in the last um, year. And this builds on a workshop that Francoise mentioned of over 250 participants we had over the weekend here in Melbourne, meaning that we really have the best um, and brightest cure researchers all with us at the moment. And I think there are some big um, issues that we've learnt about. And the first is that um, we probably are looking at, at the moment, trying to achieve long-term remission um, when we talk about cure, meaning time off antiretroviral therapy, how long can we go? And we've realised in the last year that the virus can really hang around for quite some time and then pop up at an unexpected moment in time. It is exactly what we found with the Mississippi baby. What we've learnt from that is that we need much better tools to measure virus while um, people are on treatment and once they stop treatment. And we need much better um, assays to really know where that virus is hiding. And that builds that um, Nicolas Chamon will t talk a bit about that. I think the most recent cases of the Mississippi baby and also the Boston patients who also rebounded after stopping treatment, admittedly rebounded late after stopping treatment, also tells us that what we need to do here is not just tackle the virus that persists on treatment, but also that we need uh, a good immune response there, ready to tackle any virus that emerges. And I think um, Dan Baruch's work shows us clearly that that um, will, will help us solve some of those puzzles. 
Um, finally, uh, although we know that early treatment most likely significantly reduces the amount of virus that persists in patients on, on antiretroviral therapy, most people get treated during chronic established infection and we still need to understand how to eliminate those long-lived um, reservoirs of virus. And uh, at the moment we've, we've talked largely about kick and kill strategies, but we um, probably need to develop um, other, other approaches to those long-lived uh, reservoirs. And finally, um, you know, 80% of uh, people living with HIV, of course, live in low-income countries. Um, there's, needs to be, um, a, there's a lot of effort now to try and engage low-income countries um, in, the, in the search for a cure, as well as um, greater engagement of the pharmaceutical industry, which, um, although some companies have been actively involved in this area, this should be extended, and there are efforts towards that with discussions around perhaps a, developing a public-private partnership. So with that sort of background, um, I'll hand back to Francoise. Thanks, uh, Sean. So as I said, now uh, uh, Debbie will say a few words about the last latest development regarding the Mississippi infants. Thank you, Francoise. So I'm here with uh, Dr. Hannah Gay from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. She's sitting in the front row. And we, in the past uh, three weeks, we've identified that the Mississippi child now has uh, rebound viremia. This uh, rebounding of virus was detected during a routine clinical monitoring visit where viral loads and CD4 T cell counts were done. Um, the viral load rebound was confirmed on a repeated test within 72 hours, and the child was restarted on antiviral treatment. On antiviral treatment, the viral load has dropped, and her CD4 counts have increased from 28% back to 42%. Certainly this is uh, sobering news for us because we've never, never experienced a child who's been HIV infected and have gone off treatment for 27 months without having any detectable virus using our most sensitive assays in the peripheral blood of this child. So what we've learned from this, I think first is and foremost is this child was indeed HIV infected that the effects we saw were really the effects of treatment, not prophylaxis, as has been discussed earlier. The second is we've learned that HIV can establish latency very early. This child is treated at 30 hours of age, and that this latent infection can persist for years. The child is almost four years of age, and can persist in a quiescent state in the absence of any HIV-specific immune responses. Dr. Luziaga has followed this child immunologically for two years, and we have not detected any HIV-specific immune responses. Ultrasensitive tests looking for traces of RNA did not detect any RNA before rebound viremia. So with rebound viremia, the child has seroconverted and has, is now HIV seropositive and has control of viremia, is on antiviral treatment and doing well and will be followed by her pediatrician. So we think we've learned a lot from this case, and it does provide us a strong rationale to move forward with the clinical trials uh, to look towards using very early therapy to achieve virologic remission in perinatal HIV infection. Thanks, so Debbie. Uh, Dan, Dan uh, please uh, tell us about uh, your work uh, on uh, vaccine candidate and, and vaccine as also as an approach for cure. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'll first uh, discuss a, a preclinical animal study uh, that has a remarkable parallel to the events, the recent events of the Mississippi baby that Debbie just uh, described, showing that in an animal model, the viral reservoir is also established very early, remarkably early, much earlier than anyone had anticipated before. This uh, manuscript is published today in the journal Nature. Um, in this study in monkeys, we showed that early antiretroviral therapy, even very early antiretroviral therapy, is not early enough and was insufficient for curing the viral reservoir. It appears that the reservoir is established even prior to the first evidence of plasma viremia, suggesting that if these data are translatable to humans, then as soon as one is able to diagnose a patient with HIV infection, even with the lowest levels of plasma virus, 
then the reservoir has already been established, a reservoir that is also refractory to antiretroviral therapy. Clearly, early antiretroviral therapy uh, has benefits and reduces the viral reservoir, but um, in the study that we have published today, it was unable to eradicate the reservoir. The implications are that strategies in addition to early antiretroviral therapy might be needed for viral eradication and cure. Such strategies include monoclonal antibodies, therapeutic vaccines, as well as direct reservoir activators. And uh, many groups, including ours, are working on all three of those strategies. I think I'll stop there and turn it over. Thanks, Dan. Ole, can you tell us about uh, what is an embargo today? <laughs> sure. So, um, as, as Dan was saying, um, one of the strategies to maybe try to reduce the reservoir and potentially um, eliminate the reservoir in chronically infected uh, patients is to use this kick and kill approach where you attempt to kick the latently infected cells, so the cells that have archived uh, HIV within their own uh, DNA to kick these cells out of their resting uh, stage and expose the virus um, on the surface of these cells so they can be killed and uh, eliminated by the immune system. So this kick and kill approach um, we tried to test in uh, six patients at Aarhus University Hospital. We used uh, an H-stack inhibitor, uh, which is a group of anti-cancer drugs. The H-stack inhibitor that we used is called Romadepsin. Um, Romadepsin has been shown in cell cultures and in cells taken out of patients to be able to activate um, uh, these latently infected cells. So that was our rationale for, for moving into a, a small clinical trial. Um, in this trial, we include six patients, uh, five males, one female. They were all uh, well suppressed on antiretroviral treatment uh, for a duration of uh, median duration of, of nine and a half years. Um, what we saw, we infused Romdepsin uh, three times over the time course of 14 days. What we saw was a significant release of viral particles from latently infected cells into the plasma of these uh, six patients um, despite their own antiretroviral treatment. So this, um, these viral particles were easily detectable with standard clinical assays. So we could detect the viral particles with the same assays that we use to monitor uh, treatment response in, in patients and uh, also a, a, an assay that is used by blood banks to screen for HIV in the donor blood. Um, Next, we went on to see if we could at least find a, a significant reduction in the size of the reservoir in these six patients. And from our uh, preliminary analysis, it doesn't look like there's a significant reduction in the size of the reservoir in these six patients. So what this tells us is that we can activate cells, we can induce the release of viral particles into the blood of the patients, but this may not be enough to actually make a difference on the size of the reservoir. So the next step would be to use strategies like h inhibitors and combine them with uh, interventions that are targeted towards the immune system. So this could be an HIV vaccine, and we actually uh, have that uh, study just uh, starting uh, last uh, month. Uh, but it could also be other uh, immune interventions that attempts to enhance uh, the immune system's ability to kill these uh, reactivated latently infected cells. Yeah, I think that was... Thank you. Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas uh, uh, has been involved since now many years in uh, uh, trying to identify the cells that uh, play the role of reservoir, and now he's trying to find new assets to quantify and measure the reservoir, which is critical for the future. Yeah, thank you, Francois. So, uh, as you just said, uh, it is actually a scientific priority of the International Aid Society to develop novel assays to measure the size of the reservoir. And it is important because we want to find ways to monitor the efficacy of eradication strategies. And uh, right now, the assays that we have 
uh, are pretty expensive, they require a lot of blood, uh, and we are not exactly sure what they measure. So we spent a lot of time during the past few years trying to develop novel assays that could be used in those eradication trials. And we came up with this new strategy that we called TILDA, T-I-L-D-A, which is a novel assay that requires only 10 milliliters of blood uh, that is relatively inexpensive, that can be run in two days, and more importantly, that can be implemented pretty much in any lab in the world because you need very basic instrumentation to, to use this assay. So using this assay, we've been able to confirm the benefit of early antiretroviral therapy uh, early in infection. So basically, we found that the size of the reservoir was much more restricted in people who, who start out very early on. Um, of course, the next step for us is to use this assay in clinical trials and again to monitor their efficacy. So the, the value of this uh, HIV cure symposium was to put all of us in the same room. And basically, I talked with Ole earlier. And uh, definitely, we will use some of the samples of his clinical trial and run them in the novel assay that, uh, that we have developed. And eventually, of course, what we want to do is to make this assay available to the scientific community. Thanks, Nicolas. And to hand, Steve, your vision. So I've been, asked to talk, yes, I've been asked to talk about um, sort of the future and um, just make a few quick comments. Um, <clears throat> I think it's quite clear right now that the international community is fully engaged in cure research. The funders are engaged, uh, the foundations are engaged, the communities are engaged, uh, most of the academic groups are engaged. This meeting that we just had, uh, you know, was supposed to be for a couple hundred people, but we had a, pro a very long waiting list. So there's a tremendous amount of interest. I will say that, though, in the future, in terms of potential barriers to success, the one major group not yet fully engaged is industry. We're not going to cure anyone unless we develop new drugs, and that's what industry does. And so there's a lot of efforts actually trying to identify the barriers that are preventing industry from getting engaged, um, and we think we know what they are, and we think we might know how to overcome them. Scientifically, uh, I think there are three big issues that we need to tackle. Uh, first, where does the virus live? Debbie's case, the Mississippi baby, suggests that a single virus can live in a single cell living in some reservoir somewhere in the body, and that's all it needs for the virus to take off. Uh, so we need to figure out exactly which cell the virus is in and where it resides. That's the first thing. Second thing, as Nicola just mentioned, we need to be able to measure the virus better. There are probably dozens of cases around the world now in which people have no detectable virus, absolutely no detectable virus on therapy, and they may or may not be cured. We need better ways to measure this. And finally, of course, most importantly, we need to begin to translate some of the early pilot studies into real clinical studies to see if we can actually really advance the cure agenda. And I think this meeting is going to uh, be remembered for two things. Number one, Olay's data is the first clear evidence, at least to me, that we can truly identify the latent reservoir, the hidden virus, and shock it out of its hiding place. And that is absolutely critical. I don't think anyone has shown that in people before to the, the same degree that, that Olay has shown in his study. And so I think actually that is the single most important advance at this meeting, and it's going to have a huge impact on the future. That's shock. That's getting the virus out of its hiding place. But once it comes out of its hiding place, we have to kill it. And I would say actually Dan's data that he presented on all these novel antibodies that can potentially do that is also going to have a huge impact on the future. Uh, so so that's, that's my vision. I think we need to get in industry engaged. We need to find out where the virus lives. We need to know how to measure it. And we need to begin to do bigger and better studies in terms of shock and kill. Thanks. So now uh, the floor is open for question. Please introduce yourself, give your name and introduce yourself. Julia Majew from Fairfax Media, The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, you mentioned the barriers, knowing the barriers to industry involvement. Can you explain what, what you think they are? Well. For, um, for a company to figure out whether one of their molecules or drugs might actually contribute to a cure, we need to be able to do these small studies in which we give the drug to people and show that it does something. So ultimately, we need a biomarker. 
we need a, a way to quantify the size of the reservoir. We need to be able to go into a person and figure out how much virus is there so that we can give these drugs in 10, 20 people to see if we can reduce it. We don't have that assay yet. So that's the first thing. And there's a tremendous amount of effort going on to identify that tool. The second thing is actually a bit more problematic, is how are we going to define a cure? And how are the regulators, the people who actually approve drugs, going to define a cure? Uh, and I think industry needs to know that. They need to know exactly how it is that they're going to get a, a, an intervention that is, that is approved and can be commercialized so they can sell it. And right now, the field does not have a definition on how we're going to do that, and that's a major challenge. Pam Harrison, Medscape, over here. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Sogard, Pam Harrison, Medscape. You didn't see a reduction in the size of the reservoir. Was that possibly because you weren't using a potent enough antiretroviral therapy to, um, to mop up the, the release of the viral particles that you did activate? That's a good question. So um, I think for an effective uh, reactivating strategy to be successful, you need um, some immune cells that are able to recognize the cells that you expose um, and to kill them. I think this is the major barrier to actually reducing the reservoir when you have a, a potent uh, reactivating agent. So I think romadepsin um, in this trial was quite convincing in uh, reversing uh, latency, at least in, in some of the cells, but we don't know if we reverse latency in, in 1% of cells or in 50% of cells. So there's still a lot of work to be done to know how much you can actually, how much reactivation you can induce, but at least this is um, a step forward in the sense that you can measure it with standard assays and commonly used assays all over the world. Hi, it's Sophie Scott from ABC. Just another question for Ole. So how significant is your research that you're presenting in terms of moving towards an HIV cure? So I'd rather let uh, someone else comment on that. So I think <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, significant in the sense that it's, it's something that now can be uh, investigated in settings that don't have a that advanced laboratory uh, assay set up, so it's, you can use standard assays, so in that sense it's significant, but it's still just another step towards something that may end up being a cure for HIV, so it's a step in the right direction, but I think it's, it's just a step. Can I just Sharon? ask Stephen yeah. to follow up? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll just follow up there. I mean, I think um, the significance of it is that we have always thought once the virus gets inside a cell and goes to sleep, it's stuck there forever. And what Ole's, the first studies of these drugs showed you could wake it up, but you only found a bit more virus inside the cell. And Ole's study has gone that step further to show you can wake it up and make enough virus to leave the cell. And that's quite significant because that means that the that means that the, that the cell will probably now be visible to an immune response. Mm -hmm. So it's the first step to get rid of these long-lived sleeping forms of virus with a drug that's, that's more potent than other drugs we've used already to wake up the virus. And that's actually a big step. But it's not a cure, but it's the first step to make that, that cell now visible to the immune system or another intervention. Other question? Hello, Elizabeth Finkel from Cosmos magazine. So I have two questions. The first is just a very naive one. Is it possible with what, um, is it, uh, who, who reported the paper in Science that came out today? Oh. Dan. Dan. Uh, that what, because of what you've seen in your animal studies, very early infection, and also the Mississippi baby, is it possible the, uh, the fetuses are being infected? In utero. Yeah. Fetuses. So, uh, so we know from studies looking at mother-to-child transmission and drugs to block mother-to-child transmission that indeed babies get infected in utero, what's considered in utero infection. That's a small proportion of infants who get infected. 
Um, so we do have evidence that babies get infected in utero. And in fact, for the Mississippi child, I mean, in pediatrics, the way we stratify children, whether they're infected in utero or not, is based on whether they have detectable virus nucleic acid present in the bloodstream in the first 48 hours of life. So using that definition, this child would have been considered as being infected before birth. Now, how early before birth the child is infected, we don't have a marker to tell us that. And so it is encouraging that if indeed that stratification is correct, that even in a child who's infected in utero, very early treatment, and here early treatment is 30 hours of age, we still have a wide wind of opportunity there because kids can, be, we can intervene as early as half an hour, hour of life um, in terms of this treatment strategy. So again, I want to emphasize that while we're very disappointed for this child that she requires antiretroviral treatment now to control her virus, this is really unprecedented for the field and a major step forward that a minimal antiretroviral treatment regimen, three drug regimen, started at 30 hours of life for 18 months, can allow a child to go off treatment for 27 months. So am I right in thinking that most infants are not infected in utero? So they would be the category that might still benefit from this early intervention? So we're hoping both categories will benefit from this intervention. And, and one reason is that the neonatal immune system is developing and it's tolerogenic. So these memory T cells may not form as readily in a developing immune system. And my second question is, I'm picking up a little bit of a paradox because on one hand, one of the uh, speakers mentioned, well, I think it was you, that it was possibly just a single virus in a single cell that was enough to reactivate the infection. Given that's the case, why do we even care how much you hit down the reservoir? If you haven't hit it down to zero, it's not going to make any difference. Uh, that's actually a, that's a great question. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think that the Mississippi case and other cases in the, in the past year or so make me wonder if we will ever get rid of the entire reservoir. Um, so we actually may end up in a situation where we get rid of a big chunk of it uh, and have a little bit left, but we're going to need a way to control that little bit that's left. And so, um, and there are a number of ways it can do that, right? therapeutic vaccines, antibodies, and so forth. So, so, it's, it's, so the, the field is sort of, in the past, has been split between those who just want to get rid of everything versus those who don't particularly want to get rid of everything, they just want to control it. And I actually think at the end of the day, we're going to need both, right? You're, the immune system really can't control the amount of virus that people have now. We know that. Most people basically do not do well. But hopefully, if we can get rid of 99% of it and boost the immune system, just a little bit of immune power is all you're going to need to control what's left. And that's where the field is going. And that's going to require combination approaches, which is actually complicated to do and partly why industry is not really engaging to the degree they can. Okay, we have another question. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> uh, you were the first, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'll go. go um, my name's Mark Stefano from BuzzFeed. Um, I want to know about the relationships between vaccines and the cure and whether the attention, whether it's ec economic or industry, um, has shifted away from finding a cure to uh, developing really powerful vaccines, especially when it comes to things like the Mississippi baby, I guess, letting down a lot of people's hopes for a cure. Um, maybe Francois, do you, do you feel as though that a lot of the tension at the moment, attention at the moment, is on vaccines and not the cure? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think we need both anyway. We we should not oppose vaccine research and cure research, and they are very much complementary, as uh, Steve just said. Uh, we will need to combine different approach, and we we probably need to uh, strengthen the response of the host by uh, immune-based uh, uh, therapy or vaccine uh, therapy. So uh, uh, that's clear for me that uh, both should be continued in parallel. And by the way, certainly uh, as part of, uh, this is something that we will discuss uh, this week, but as part of the IAS HIV vaccine initiative, we will strengthen the relationship 
uh, between cure research and vaccine research. And Dan, maybe you can say a few words as well on that. Sure. Uh, so I'll just uh, reiterate what Steve and Francois have said, that um, in my view, there's no tension at all between them because they're complementary. In fact, vaccine research will likely be part of interventions that are uh, being explored for cure. So in, 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 in fact, uh, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. They're both needed, and I don't see any tension between them. Yeah. Hi, Jason Gale from uh, Bloomberg News. Um, so we've heard the news about the Mississippi baby and then Ollie's um, research. I'm wondering if um, from that you could uh, let us know a, a temperature check um, in terms of your optimism for a cure. Are you febrile or hypothermic right now? <laughs> Are you asking me? <laughs> Everyone. Okay. So I'm... I'm uh, I'm Just very try. optimistic <laughs> for remission uh, for pediatric uh, patients because, I, again, I, I will say this again, is that 27 months of antiretroviral treatment with a strategy that's not the best that we can have to achieve this outcome is spectacular in my mind and really is the catalyst, I think, for us to move forward. I mean... It, it, it is. A, a look, you, of course, I have to speak about the Visconti patient because nobody is speaking about the Visconti <laughs> patient. But, uh, you know, it's uh, some of them, we have 20 patients today uh, that stopped the treatment. And it's uh, 10 years ago for some of them that they stopped the treatment and they are still controlling their virus. So uh, there's no reason not to continue and to be optimistic for the future. I think one other key point about the um, Mississippi baby, Debbie says that 27 months off treatment with the viral under control is unprecedented. And secondly, the Mississippi baby and also the Boston patients had, poor, had no immunity to HIV. So they had the extreme of very, very small amounts of virus, but absolutely no immune response, the baby, because the baby was treated very early, the Boston patients, because they had received a transplant. So I think it's that, so that, that's a key factor about, about what may have had a play in the remission and the fact the virus came back. You know, I got a, um, a lot of people ask me about the Mississippi case and, and whether I was um, disappointed and whether it's going to affect my enthusiasm. And, and obviously it's a tragic situation for the baby and the child, but I'm hoping, I'm sure the child will get the best care possible. And, Hopefully one day she will know how important she was in the history of HIV in terms of cure research. Um, but as a scientist, it, the, the, these failures are actually often far more instructive than successes. And, and with regard to this particular case, it, it again, it confirms what we all assumed but didn't really know, that it just takes one cell that can live for years to start the whole process over. So we really now know what we need to go after. And secondly, at least for me, it has really sort of focused my research on the need for long-term surveillance, that we may never be able to get rid of all the virus, but we're going to have to build up the immune system in some way to control a little bit of virus. So, so I actually perceive the Mississippi case scientifically uh, as a great success, and, I, and, I, and I'm hopeful that, 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 the, that the child herself will, will get the best care possible and, and, and will do well. Yes, Sophie? Uh, Sophie Lullier from Sedaction, from France. Um, I understand yesterday in your talk, Francoise, that um, in the Sedaction satellite, that uh, the mother of the Mississippi baby is maybe a long time non progressor or kind of. Um, this, may that be a part of um, the reason what was, uh, we observed? with the baby. Mm. Thank you for asking the question because it was one question that I wanted myself to ask to Debbie. <laughs> uh, because my understanding when the, the case was presented is that the mother has a very low viral load um, and I was wondering whether the mother has a, a strong immune response and uh, during the first months of birth, uh, the baby may, of course may have the, 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 the uh, the immunity of the mothers that may have played a role in controlling the infection as well. 
So I'll say we've been unable to study the immune response in the mother for reasons that we can't explain at this time. But to the best of our knowledge, I mean, we've done HLA typing on the child looking for protective alleles and have not identified um, that. I think the, the main part here, and, and there may be unknown factors, immune factors that confer this sort of control um, in terms of post-viremic rebound. But I will say in the period of sustained remission, the 27 months, there was no detectable HIV-specific immune response. So antibody responses or cellular immune responses. So this is a case of virologic control in the absence of an immune response, which is not consistent with what we know about long-term non-progressors or elite controllers. Their outcome is based on an immune response. So there was absolutely no immune response. And there was no immune response because there was no virus expression in this child. So that's the best that we can answer the case at this point. So uh, perhaps down the line we'll be able to do additional studies on maternal samples, short of sequencing, which we needed to do to confirm reemergence of infection um, in this child rather than reinfection from a different source. We've not been able to conduct extensive immunologic studies on the mother. Hi. Hi, my name is Tabula from South Africa. Um, you will know the situation in my country with so many people infected and affected by HIV and AIDS. There's only just one question from the community. They just want to know when, when are the scientists finding a cure for HIV? How close or how far are we? I know it may be a bit basic, but most of our people are, are the illiterate and the poor. They just want to know, is it possible? Is it coming anytime soon? Are you able to give us a response to that? I will let uh, the, the others to give their opinion, but when uh, generally uh, people are asking me this question, I say no, I will not answer. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how, how long it will take uh, to, give, to, to get a, a, a cure or to get a treatment inducing remission. We sh cannot really answer, and I, I personally think that we should not give any dates. We should not make uh, what has been done for vaccine uh, in the past uh, to say that we will have a vaccine in, in I, I remember 1984, Margaret Eckler said we will have a vaccine in two years. Look, uh, we are now 30 years after that, we still do not have a vaccine. So I, I, I don't think we should give any hope uh, today. What we know is that we should move on because there is plenty of uh, uh, scientific evidence, plenty of data that are telling us that uh, we can make progress, how many years we need to get a, a new strate therapeutic strategy, we don't know. Any other? No. You want to, to give your? I mean, you know, I would, I would say that a cure which is actually applicable to everybody around the world. Um, yeah, many very smart people don't think it's possible or will ever be possible. Um, and my personal opinion is that if it is possible and we can do it, it's going to take many, many, many years. Uh, Fred Scheich, I from Portland, Oregon. Uh, kind of segueing from that, uh, the, and you mentioned earlier about the combinations of vaccine and cure research, whatever that might be, and, and compounds. How do you see that rolling out? Do you feel like there's the possibility of working with two compounds, one from vaccines, another from um, other forms of uh, cancer type drugs that you're working with? How do you see that rolling out? Can you do the studies with two things? Because it seems to me like that would be the, the magic, is when you start to combine, you get the real improvement or possibilities. Uh, Ole might want to answer that because yes. that's what, uh, exactly so what they're doing. I, I can give you a quick answer and say that we have such a study ongoing now, um, just combining this compound that uh, I mentioned, romodepsin, together with a therapeutic HIV vaccine that has been tested in, in more than 100 HIV patients already. So we have that study ongoing. Uh, we just started enrolling patients. Um, so it will be a while before we have any results, but at least it's, it's the first combination trial. So yes. 
And just to follow up, would it maybe a triple combination, or are you thinking uh, about that? Or? I think we're thinking about a lot of things, but um, we need to take one step at a time. So, and, and this is already a, a, a pretty big step just to combine two different compounds. Thank you. Uh, Karen O'Sullivan from Channel 7 News here in Melbourne. Um, Ollie, just wondering if you can give us any more detail about your trials, um, just the nuts and bolts of how long it went for. You said there were peop the people involved, where they were from. If you can expand any further on the trial itself. Uh, sure. So, um, as I said, six patients were enrolled, um, and they were all Caucasian patients, all from our own um, outpatient clinic at Oxford University Hospital. All were uh, on effective antiretroviral treatment. Um, the trial was initiated in uh, early April this year, um, and we just we still have just done the last follow-up visits just literally before we came here. Um, so we are still in the process of analyzing the data, but the data that I'm presenting tomorrow is what we have so far. Um, and um, I think that's enough at least to say that the uh, agent was, was successful in doing the job that they were supposed to, and that is to kick virus out of the cells. I'm afraid we, we have to, to stop. Uh, if you like to ask a specific question to a participant, that is possible, but outside of the room because they are waiting for, for, for the room that would be used for another press conference. I just would like to thank uh, all the participants to this uh, 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 press conference. i like also to remind you what has been told to you at the beginning, all the data are an, an embargo until tomorrow, 2.30. Please respect the embargo. Thank you very much.